Well, this morning we continue our series on the atonement. And today we begin dealing uh, with the results of the atonement. What were the results? What do we mean by that phrase? Well, what we mean is the, oh, I guess we could use the word consequences that have followed or flowed from to the elect in relation to God and his law. Now, I want us to consider, first of all, the supreme aim as one of the results. What was the supreme aim? And it's interesting, I believe, that we would use that word supreme because it distinguishes it perhaps from other results that might not be so um, supreme in their consequences. The supreme, and, and think about this, the supreme aim of God in the atonement was the advancement of his own glory. Amen. <clears throat> the advancement of his own glory. Which consisted of a wonderful and glorious manifestation of his attributes. In the process of leading up to the atonement, following the atonement, the purpose of the atonement, who is getting the glory in all of this? Well, it's God himself. Now, you've heard me mention probably num numerous times uh, my life verse is Romans eleven thirty six. And I've quoted it enough, you should know it by memory by now. Uh, Romans eleven thirty six, And I suggest that this be one of your important uh, verses for your own edification. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Amen. So you see, even in those very few words, how concise it is that everything is to point to God's glory. And likewise, the atonement. Um, is for his glory. Now there's some things that we need to understand and keep in mind. For God to be glorified in this process of the atonement, uh, ultimately the sinner, and let me qualify that, the elect sinner, must be reinstated into God's favor. We can think about that for quite a while and what that involves and what it means. Um, turn with me to 1 Peter 3 and verse 18. First Peter three eighteen. For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, in order that he might bring us to God. 
having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. You see, Christ hath also once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might think of those words, bring us to God. What a statement. Um, there's a lot we could um, imagine and think about in terms of bring us. You know, we bring people to church sometimes. We uh, bring them home with us to visit. It's a nice phrase. Think of it. All that was involved to bring us to God. And it all began in the covenant of redemption. He chose us in Christ before the world was created. That's part of bringing us to God back in eternity. And in time, God brought it to pass. Bringing us to God is a expression of accomplishment. Describing or setting before us the whole work of our salvation involving the removal of all hindrances and the bestowal of everything required in that process. Can we be more specific? We can. Think. In order for the elect viewed as fallen in Adam to be brought to God, it was necessary that all enmity between them should be removed. In other words, reconciliation has to take place. Amen. Now, what does that mean? What does that require? It was necessary that the guilt of all of our transgressions should be canceled. In other words, that there be remission of sin. Further, further, it was necessary that they should be delivered from all bondage, that they should be redeemed. Finally, it was necessary that they should be made both legally and experimentally Righteous. That's a big truckload of truth. That's a semi load of truth. Now, the efficient purpose existed in divine in the divine mind from how far back? All of eternity. Mm -hmm. Did I? <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, I was just, I was telling, I was thinking about, you know, Romans 11. Yeah. I'm still dwelling on that. Okay. Little, <laughs> That's uh, fine. You know, what Paul said about God the Father there in Romans 11, John said about Christ in John 1, you know, all things are through him, to him, and for him. I mean, right. I was, I was just thinking about well, that's good. That's a good <laughs> comparison. Be, and good comparison and well taken. Well taken. Good comment. There are these results in the atonement. Number one, 
reconciliation. Um, let me see what I want us to do here. Um, turn with me to Second Corinthians five. Verse 18 and 19. You see, this gospel of grace which God has called his servants to proclaim is described in these words. <clears throat> and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation and hath committed to us the word of reconciliation. What does this tell us? What does this show us? This at once shows us the great importance of having a clear scriptural view of what we're considering. Otherwise, it's impossible to honor God in the preaching which should ever be our first and chief concern or to edify his people. Two concerns. What are they? Honor God, edify his people. Now, if you have teaching and preaching, and I don't mean that you should get up and preach on the atonement every Sunday, I don't mean that. But the basic truth should be underlying it and permeating it. It should ooze out here and there uh, as we're being, as the word is being preached. Why? Why is that so vitally important? Because a mistake at this point has consequences. Serious consequences. It injures the entire thrust of our evangelical ministry, causing us to set forth a perverted presentation of the gospel. Or we could call it God's saving truth. So if you don't go in to the process of evangelizing or preaching um, for the aim of drawing souls to Christ. We've got to stay on target. And these foundational truths are absolutely necessary to keep us in line so that we don't vary one way or the other. Um, someone has once said the realization of this ought to bow every minister of the gospel before God in deep humility, earnestly entreating God for divine light and wisdom that he may be so taught of the Lord that the gospel trumpet may give forth no uncertain sound when it is placed to his lips. Quite descriptive. Uh, Stephen and I being musicians, that, that rings a bell, <laughs> doesn't it? Yes. I just was thinking, what what happens if you have a in the old army when they had the blast of the trumpet to give orders? What happens if a guy can't keep on his uh, prescribed way of blowing the trumpet? If he blows it uncertainly or makes mistakes, what happens?
you got a whole field of soldiers out there that it doesn't make sense. What do we do now? And we certainly don't want our preaching to be that way. In fact, let's put it this way. For better not to preach at all than to preach contrary to the scripture. Doing two things, dishonoring God and endangering souls in the process. Now, what does reconcile mean? <coughs> Do you know? There's two little words that'll help us if we remember them. Bring together. Bring together. Bring together again those who have been alienated and cause them to reunite, to restore peace and concord by dealing with and removing the cause of the division. Here's a good verse along this line, Matthew 5, 23 and 24. Matthew 5, 23 and 24. If thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there the gift before the altar, and go thy way. First, be reconciled to your brother. This is the first mention of the word reconcile in the New Testament. Here the offender, follow closely, is not instructed to reconcile himself, but the person whom he has offended. You see, what this means is the person who has done the injury is the one responsible for making up the difference. What is he supposed to do? Well, he is to propitiate his brother to himself by a compensation of some kind. He has to enter into the transaction of reconciliation. Christ did not say, careful, conciliate thy own displeasure toward thy brother, but remove his displeasure against you. So what is the teaching of Matthew 5? It is plain teaching, and here it is a good thing to hang on to, is that the one who has offended should go and seek to appease the anger of the one who has been offended. What does that involve? It involves obtaining his forgiveness and regaining his friendship by humbling himself before him, seeking pardon, satisfying him for any injury that may have been done.
It's not going to him and saying, uh, well, I was wrong, but you were wrong too. No, no. It's taking all of the blame. It's my fault. And interestingly enough, you might want to make a mental note of this. When we seek the forgiveness of someone that we've offended, and you go to them and say, I want you to forgive me. And they reply, oh, it's okay. Uh -huh. It's not okay. I want you to forgive me. It's not, eh, forget it. Huh. It hasn't been resolved, it hasn't been settled. I want you to forgive me and insist on that as part of your reason for requesting his forgiveness. Otherwise, it's not been taken care of. You don't just, okay, never mind. Because many, many times the cause of that abscesses and grows and creates bitterness, division, on and on and on. Try to resolve it rightfully by saying, I want you to forgive me. Without that, to the best of your ability to obtain that, there's been no reconciliation. It's just been swept under the rug. And that's not good because it will reappear again. Maybe not in that same incident of exact problem, but there will still be that tension that hasn't been resolved. Um, listen carefully to this statement. The scripture speaks of God's having reconciled us to himself by the blood of Christ on the cross. Turn with me to Colossians 1. And let's begin with verse 19. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself. See the what we're saying here? But he goes on. Having made peace through the blood of his cross, Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Think about this. It does not refer to a subjective change which has been wrought in our hearts, producing our laying down enmity towards God and our turning to him in loving obedience. But follow closely here. It expresses one of the cardinal effects or results of his, God's, having graciously provided and accepted an atonement for us so that instead of inflicting upon us the punishment that we so deserve, we are instead received into his full favor on Christ's. Okay, that statement is pregnant with meaning, worthy of spending a lot of, a lot of time. But what do we basically have here? We have God reconciling us to himself through 
Christ. And what a beautiful picture of the atonement that is. Um, again, I say that we need to, and I believe, I'm sure you've been impressed, as, as I believe I have, that all of this is, in a sense, and I'm not sure this is a good de description, but it's behind the scenes. Uh, according to Bob Jones, I had the opportunity of playing in their symphony orchestra, the Opera Tosca. And he said, what does that mean to me? Well, all I can tell you, if you never, and I doubt you have, it, maybe Stephen has, played in a symphony orchestra that's playing for a two-hour opera with opera stars brought here from Metropolitan Opera <coughs> to sing the leading roles. That's an event that you'll never forget. But to see, in a sense, the behind the scenes, not everything that was going out front. And, um, there's a sense, dear people, in which we, and rightfully so, I'm not condemning this, but I'm saying let us be careful that we don't shortchange ourselves on what actually took place when our Lord died on the cross. I think that it's very easy for us to pass that off as an evangelical truth which is okay in a sense to make a statement that way. But if that statement uh, is all we have in terms of our understanding and appreciation for the work of God in the atonement that took place, reaching its beginnings all the way back to eternity before the world was created. You say, how so? because of the covenant of redemption. That's where the cross had its beginning in a sense. Because the choosing of the elect was going to lead to our Lord's virgin birth, sinless life, his vicarious atonement, his resurrection from the dead, all of that was in seed form at the moment of that covenant of redemption when God said, these are the ones I'm going to save. And Christ said, I'm willing to do it. And then to see that played out in history. That's the hand. You shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Think of the theology that's in those few words. No reconciliation. Well, let me restate that. Reconciliation means that transgressors of God's law have been restored to the judicial favor of God through Christ having closed the breach which sin had made between them. Reconciliation affects no change in God himself, but it does in the administration of his government. 
lot to think about. I want to, um, this probably falls way short of defining anything, but I think it touches up on some areas that may give us a, a little light. When I worked as a juvenile probation officer back in the 50s, uh, we used what we call an open-end commitment. And an open-end commitment was where I had a conference with the judge and we agreed that we would employ or use the open-end commitment on a particular case. And this will interest you, I believe, and show you a few things. The open-end commitment was like this. I would bring the parents and the boy in to the court. The judge would begin reading the offense. Such and such a time you stole a car, you wrecked it. And the more he read and the more he uncovered the details uh, legally, he appeared to become very upset and agitated to the point that he would just say, I'm through with this whole mess, just get out of the court. And he would order them to leave, go out in the waiting room, the parent. I would go with them. And I'd get outside with them and I'd say, wow, man, he is really mad. There's no telling what's going to happen. And we would let that stew for about a half hour. And then call them back in. And the judge would say, well, son, i tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to send you to the training school. But we're not going to take your body down there yet. The order is being signed. You are committed. It's just that we're not going to take you down there yet. And the reason for that is Mr. Walters thinks he can help you. Good guy, bad guy. Mr. Walters thinks he, I don't think he can, I don't think it'll work, but he wants to try. So I'm turning you over to him and all you have to do is blink crooked and he can have you picked up and delivered. No further process. The order's been signed right now. You're committed. But I just cite that for you because that was a very practical way. Not, it didn't work every time. But I'm telling you, it would scare the wits out of a kid that he would walk the line and we would salvage him and success in working with him. It was a process. Uh, it might interest you to know that years later that they uh, said that was not legal. Couldn't do it. Every child had to have a lawyer. <laughs> Come on. Here you are trying to help these kids. and um, Just common sense. But what's the point that I'm making here? Here you can have a judge in control of your destiny at the moment, appearing to be very, very angry, and there's a space for some reconciliation in terms of, okay, let's go this route uh, for the good of the boy. Um, little do we realize, dear ones, the awesomeness, the fear that should be in our thoughts when we think of it. God, the eternal creator and judge of all the earth. And um, what 
good news, what good news we have when, I, when you witness as God gives you the opportunity to a lost soul. And God, by his Holy Spirit, brings them under the weight and the conviction of their sin. And then you step in and say, such were some of you. But, but, you are washed. You are cleansed. And uh, that's the real gospel message, isn't it? Well, um, I think, let me check to make sure that this is where I want to stop. I will take one more paragraph here. And I'll read it very carefully. Reconciliation with God does not mean a change of heart in Him from an angry disposition to a friendly affection. Now follow closely. Rather, it refers to an effect which has followed from that proper and full satisfaction which Christ offered to the violated law and to the offended justice of God. So important. So vitally important. We repeat, it is God in his character of judge who, insisting upon an atonement, has now no further demand to make. And therefore, must properly said to be appeased or reconciled to his people. Prices have been paid. That's the atonement. That's Christ's suffering on the cross. Well, we'll stop there and pray for God's blessing. Father, we thank you that you have blessed us in so many ways. And again, we pray that you will give us a deeper, ever deepening appreciation for what really took place in the atonement, reaching all the way back into eternity. And one day, when we are with our Lord in heaven, reaching all the way into heaven. The implications are many and far-reaching. May we know them, and may we appreciate them, as we should. We ask in Christ's name, amen.